Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 31st episode of Patterson in Pursuit. You know, there are a few things that you're not supposed to talk about. Politics is one of them. Religion is another one. But one of the most taboo issues, especially for an intellectual, is to talk about religious experience. Maybe we can get away with talking about religious theology, but religious experience, man, that's got to be beyond the pale. Only those crazies have religious experiences. Well, I've got some news for you. My guest today has had religious experiences, and yours truly has had religious experiences. Now, on the pursuit of truth, this is something that I want to try to explain. I have a loose theoretical framework to try to explain my own religious experience, but I want to go around and ask people about the nature of their own experiences and see what I can learn from them. As philosophers, as people who are pursuing the truth, we must acknowledge an essential part of human existence for all of recorded history has been talking about religious experience. And just maybe in the past century or so, it has become taboo. So I'm pleased to say to smash the ceilings and to break the taboo, I'm joined by Mr. Isaac Morehouse, who is the CEO of Praxis, the company that is sponsoring this show. We actually recorded this interview last July. It was one of the first interviews that I recorded. I've been kind of keeping it in the bank for the right moment, and I think this week is the right moment. So before we dive into it, I want to tell you about the company Praxis that he is the CEO and co-founder of. Praxis is made for young people who are unsatisfied with their college experience or who want to avoid the unsatisfactory modern college experience, people who crave a taste of reality. What it is is a nine-month program. It's three months of professional boot camp that's followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship in the real world. The program is so successful that now they are contractually guaranteeing their participants upon graduation a $40,000 a year job offer. The net cost of the program on top of all of this is $0. So if you are an ambitious young person, check out Praxis. Go to discoverpraxis.com, click on the schedule a call button on their homepage, and see if it's right for you. Now, in addition to being the CEO of Praxis, Isaac's a pretty cool guy. One of the reasons I have a lot of respect for him is he was one of the first people that encouraged me to do what I'm currently doing. Years ago, we met probably in 2011. I was working at a nonprofit, and Isaac was there. He was one of the speakers for the organization that I was working for. And we talked a little bit about philosophy. We talked quite a bit about academia. And he was 100% in favor of me pursuing the thing that I had no training in, I had no background in, and just a passion for, which is philosophy. So he was one of those people that saw competence in me, with, even without my credentialing. And since that time, many years ago, he has formed his own company based on that principle. So I'm very pleased that over a year ago now, I got to venture out into the taboo waters of talking about religious experiences, talking about Christianity, and all those things that serious intellectuals aren't supposed to talk about. Enjoy. Mr. Isaac Morehouse, thank you for coming on the podcast. Oh, absolutely. It's a pleasure. So, Isaac, uh, you are a very interesting and knowledgeable guy uh, in a whole host of different areas. Uh, you're very well read, got a lot of respect for you, and um, from my perspective, you're a very independent guy, both uh, intellectually and professionally. Um, I don't think you put too much uh, faith in established authority, uh, which I really appreciate. But I want to talk to you today about a topic that you're perhaps not most well known for or maybe even most comfortable with, um, it's religious ideas. And of course, you know, they say, uh, in order to be polite, you're, you're never supposed to talk about politics or religion. Um, but I, I think that... Those... <laughs> you, you've never been accused of being overly polite, Steve. No, no, precisely. So uh, I think those are two of the most important topics. So naturally, that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, before we start, though, I just want to put a disclaimer out there, both for you and for me and for everybody watching uh, or listening, that this is not a debate. Um, I don't have any intention of trying to prove your ideas right or wrong or anything like that. This is really just uh, an exercise in learning. I don't have the expectation that you have all religious ideas sorted out. I certainly don't. And people have been talking about these things for 
thousands of years and disagreeing. So I do not have any expectation that you are a religious expert, and I am not either. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe I can learn from you, and maybe you can learn from me. And I just want to kind of explore these ideas with you in real time. Um, does that sound palatable? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I am not at all a fan of debates in general because I find them to be like one of the least enlightening forms of <laughs> trying to understand things. So uh, I, I love the idea of just an open exploration. Okay. So if you could give a like a, a, a summary or a few paragraph overview of your own personal religious ideas, how would you do it? Oh man, that that is probably the hardest question to answer, but I, I'll try. I'll, I'll give it a shot here in a very, very basic sort of abstract sense. So, I think I think that the universe is vast, and I think there are entities and things that exist well beyond what we can imagine or see with our senses. I think there is a tremendous amount of, I guess, mystery in the universe and things that we can probably interact with um, in, in ways that go beyond just our ability to reason. So things through whether it be, you know, contemplation and meditation or various spiritual practices, I think there's something real going on there um, and something that's maybe hard to put into words. And so I think there's a value to kind of what I would call uh, a religious experience or, or practice or tradition to the extent to which it, it helps us access truths that go beyond those which we can access with with reason alone. And I don't think that they contradict reason. Um, I don't think that they, the, the two are in conflict, but I think that there's sort of an additional set of tools that humans can use or experiences to access some form of truth. And I think there's something objective, right? I think that a, a objective truth exists. I think that there is some sense of, let's say, morality, right and wrong, or just or just causal relationships in the universe. I mean, take logic itself, you know, two plus two equals four. I think that exists in some objective way beyond what can be measured. Um, and I think that th there's there's some sense in which this this objective truth, this series of, you could call it the laws of the universe, you could call it God or infinite intelligence. Um, there's something there that attempting to align our lives with and not, and be in alignment with, um, which maybe different religious traditions would call like the process of, of being saved or, or finding, you know, achieving enlightenment. I think there's something to that. So I guess that's in, in the in the least specific and the most vague <laughs> sense, but the sense that I'm, I'm probably most comfortable with. That's kind of my uh, religious beliefs in a nutshell. OK, there's a lot there. It's abstract, but there's a lot there. So I want to start kind of with we'll, try, we'll take a very um, basic religious question in your conception of this higher power. Um, is this. Let's just, for lack of a better term, let's call it God. It's a loaded term, but sure. I think that's what a lot of religious people throughout history would, would have called it. Yeah. Do, do you conceptualize that as an actual being, like a, like a, a, a person, or is it kind of, uh, is it more abstract principles, or is it like a, is it like the, a force that's in, in the universe? Yes. <laughs> no, I, would, <laughs> I would say that, I mean... The, the idea of, and I'm very comfortable using uh, the word God, even though, um, you know, it it means totally different things to different people. Uh, so it depends, I guess, on, on who I'm talking with. But yeah, to, to define some kind of uh, universal principle, infinite intelligence, something like that as God, is that personal or impersonal? It's kind of a weird question to me, right? So if I asked you, is logic personal or is love personal? or uh, wisdom, it's kind of like, well, I experience it in a very personal way at times, but it's not a person mm -hmm. necessarily. It's not, certainly it's not embodied or even some sort of, you know, even, even when we think of disembodied spirits or whatever, we think, we imagine them with bodies that are just see-through, right? right? Like, <laughs> like, and I think that's because we have to use metaphor, whether we want to or not sometimes. And when talking about things that are not sort of physical, tangible in nature, 
Um, or even things that, you know, that we're phenom- uh, familiar with that we can't see, but we can feel like, you know, whatever the wind or gases or radiation or something like that. We, we are forced to use these metaphors like, you know, there's all sorts of metaphors through the ages of wisdom or justice as being a, a woman, a, a female sort of entity or, or, you know, the muses speaking to you. I think that language is helpful and useful at times, but I also think it's very limiting. Like, I, I don't think that God or uh, objective truth is some being that's located at some particular place, mm-hmm. um, even even in some other dimension at any given time. I think it's just sort of the fabric of reality, if you will. But even saying fabric, it, fe- it feels very, <laughs> very tangible. So I guess to me, I don't know if it matters what attributes in the minute in the minute I try to, to to give attributes to this concept of God I almost think it's it's a little bit limiting in some ways those can mm-hmm. be useful here and there as as tools but I don't cling on to any one of them now that sounds like a more eastern flavor perspective on religion that yeah which is which is great um, which which is great like I know a little enough to know that that definitely it has some eastern roots but I I like know almost nothing about most <laughs> eastern traditions this is just sort of um I've just sort of ended up here <laughs> well I'm glad you said that I, I will uh I will participate uh, and add this that it, recently I've been doing a lot of research on eastern religions and eastern ideas and I find them fascinating and I think our I think the popular western conception of eastern ideas is very crude and imprecise. I think when you really dive into what they're talking about, very very profound, very subtle. I think in some ways inaccurate, but uh serious absolutely even even something um radical like uh eastern mysticism that all is one um uh I don't think it's accurate, but I think it has a profoundly uh, careful argument behind it. Yeah. You know, there's this weird tendency. So I grew up in the evangelical tradition, um, obviously in, in the West, in, in the Midwest of the United States, but there's this tendency to, to sort of use these terms Eastern and Western in this really like absurd blanket way. And, (laughs) and, and there's these trends, right. Where I remember, you know, probably in my teens, several friends and stuff, there's these trends of like, you know, every book and every, whether it's philosophy or religion, that, you know, anything Western is like old and stodgy and repressive and like anything <laughs> Eastern is like more enlightened and better. And like, it's just cause it's weird and it's different. And right. this, this almost obsession with like the Eastern tradition and then vice versa. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, I think it's kind of silly and bizarre sometimes, but to the extent that there's some, some substantial differences when it comes to philosophy, um, Western sort of analytic philosophy to me is, is phenomenal. But when it comes to religious sort of experience, I am so drawn to so many of the Eastern practices without, with, when I'm not asked, when, I, when, when there's no demand to explain something logically, I tend to be very drawn to the things like practices and, and um, metaphors and mythology uh, of the East, because there's something really beautiful in it that helps me kind of, I don't know, explore myself and, and the universe um, in a way that I find very, um, you know, I don't know, very fulfilling, I guess. You say you're drawn to the kind of experiential side of human existence and not just the purely cerebral. Have you had any ex- just experiences that you could try to crudely uh, put into words that would reinforce the idea that there is more than just the sterile uh, logic sign of human human existence. Yeah, and I, or is that I too personal? No, no, it's not. I I don't usually like to talk about them in terms of like bringing them up, but I will always answer if someone asks me. That the reason is, I just I always feel like, for one, um, there's a million ways you could define and describe any kind of you know mystical experience, and I don't even know that any of them are more or less valid. If someone were to say everything you think you've experienced can be explained purely by some, you know, biological chemical reaction, but mm-hmm. I don't know, they could be right. But like from my subjective experience, it felt a certain way and that was meaningful to me. And I, I don't really need anyone to believe anything about it. And so I usually just basically keep it to myself, but I, I have had, um, a number of, I don't know, probably a dozen or fewer in my life experiences that, I just describe them as like profound experiences on a level that goes beyond, you know, I've, I've had plenty of intellectual light bulb moments that are truly exhilarating. Mm-hmm. You know, the first time reading Bastiat and understanding economics, you get that, that sense of like, oh my gosh, boom, I get it. It makes sense. 
but but that's on an intellectual level. On a different level, I have certainly had some some experiences like that. And I mean, I would say, okay, I'll give you I'll give you one example. Okay. When I was probably, I think I was 19. Um, I was I was sitting outside uh, my house. I was I was I must I must have been 20. I was newly married. I got married two weeks before I turned 20. So <laughs> <laughs> I was a young uh, a young husband as well. <laughs> and um, and I think I was sitting outside smoking a cigar. And it was that night and looking up the stars. And and I was just sort of you know having one of those like, what is my life all about? Sort of you know, moments and, and contemplating. And I had this just like really bizarre, um, sensation of it's, it's very, very hard to explain what, like what sort of what went on, but I basically had a conversation. Now I would call it uh, a conversation with God, but, but I don't even care if it's with my own subconscious or because yes, like I was in control of this sort of back and forth in some way. But it, it was, it's like if you've ever had this where you sit down to write and people will talk about the muses and like something is flowing through you. You're mm-hmm. tapping into something that's not just what you're like very consciously constructing in the front of your mind. There's something coming from somewhere else. So I was having this sort of back and forth where I was asking questions like, what am I, what, what is my life all about? And I was getting these responses and, and I, and I sort of wrote the whole thing out in sort of poetic form. Wow. But the basic gist of the conversation was. Every time I would ask a question, I would get this response, make people free. And I kept asking about how can I do that? I don't even know how to be free. And it was like essentially like very little deviation from that. And and it was really weird because I, I almost don't like when I wrote it out in sort of poetic form and, and, and I and I go back to it. I mean, I revisit this all the time. This has essentially become like my guiding purpose in life is wow. to make people free. And And what's so weird about it, Steve, is that. I would never choose that phrase, make people free, because it, it feels very uncomfortable to me. It has the word make in it, <laughs> which seems like the opposite of freedom, right? Like like help people become free, unchain people, something like that. That's something that I would use, right? Make people free. I don't like it, but I can't deny it. Like this is this back and forth experience I had. It was it was truly it was truly awe-inspiring and very profound. And I remember I went inside, I told my wife all about it. I wrote it all out. And I, it was like, it was putting into words something that I'd been searching for, for a number of years. And that like, to this day, everything I do is essentially guided by that. I know I exist to make people free. Wow. And I have to continue to figure out what that means. It, it, it might mean free from guilt or shame or obligations that are not from within. It might be free in the political sense, uh, from external oppression. It could mean a lot of things. And I'm always trying to sort of explore that. But I always sort of know, like, I have this pact with, with God, with the universe, like, this is what I'm here for. And to the extent that I'm doing that, I'm fulfilled. And when I'm, when I'm deviating from that, I'm less fulfilled. So that's probably one of the most profound such experiences I've had. That is, uh, that's extraordinary. Um, and I also have had uh, a, a several experiences that I would say have that kind of communicative quality. Um, and for me, it wasn't uh, about a, a career. For me, it was um, the moment that I realized for the first time that I loved my wife. Um, it was even thinking about it will, will bring tears to my eyes. It was the most profound moment I have ever experienced and instantly converted me, um, from a, something like a deist to a, for lack of a better term, horrible term, a Christian, um, which growing (laughs) up, it is a rough term, isn't it? It it is. Um, growing up, I grew up in Christian community and it's not, it's not that kind of Christianity. It's, it's my purpose for existence. Um, and I, in fact, I think perhaps human, uh, existence in general is to love. And this is very correlated with what a lot of other people, you know, have written throughout the years, but the actual, you know, the qualia of this, of this awareness and of this dynamic was, uh, there's, there is literally no words that can express how overwhelming it it was, Mm -hmm. especially from my perspective, which I was pretty confident that there was no, um, personal God in this way, or like, like, and for me is very personal in the sense that I actually had the positive experience 
a feeling uh, that I was given knowledge by something that was greater than myself, which yeah. <laughs> from a skeptical perspective, yeah. which is kind of my default perspective, was flabbergasting, life-changing on the spot. And what, what I really find interesting is I've had a few conversations like this with people just throughout the years because I'm kind of curious. And a lot of people have had these kind of experiences. Yeah. They've had, they're sitting out there looking at the stars or looking at a piece of art. And there's some, there's some experience that they have where they have this kind of immediate awareness. And, and it's like, um, if, uh, if the concepts in their head, you know, were like a zipper, it's like the, the, the thing goes up the zipper and everything kind of clicks together all at once. Is this something that, that, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and there's, there's nothing like those experiences to like, you know, it's real and, and so profound when any fear or anxiety about anything, any of the typical terrestrial stuff, it's just put in this perspective where like, you just don't care. You just see things differently. I, you know, one of the things that, so, so as I said, I grew up in the, you know, cause I'm even evangelical Christian tradition and, um, the churches that I grew up in, I was very, very involved in doing a lot of different groups and, and in the, um, sort of on the worship team where we're, all the churches were very contemporary, basically rock style worship stuff. And even to this day, I don't really like anything else about a church service. Um, <laughs> but the, that experience, even though a lot of the music is pretty cheesy, it's really basic, chord, you know, it's like the most basic chord progressions you can come up with because they want it to be easy for people to play. Sometimes the lyrics are just like reused and, and not all that profound in terms of just like analyzing it. But that experience to me, and, and music in general, but especially worship music, for whatever reason, I can just enter in like immediately. I'll find myself uh, weeping sometimes. I'll find myself just sort of like transported to another place. Like I just enter into an experience that I feel like I'm accessing things. Sometimes I have kind of I, I hate to use the word visions because it's not like I'm seeing like I know that it's in my mind's eye. But it but it comes from somewhere other than like my conscious thought, you know, as I'm sort of entering into that to that kind of um, worshipful state. So, yeah, I have certainly had experiences like that, a, a, quite a number of them. And but I also know, um, you know, growing up, my brother, uh, very close friends with me and, and still is very, very similar in terms of our, our beliefs. But he never really had that kind of experience. And like. I would always feel kind of bad for him, you know, like, like he never seemed to be like overcome with, you know, uh, emotion or not even just emotion to have that kind of, I don't know, transcendental experience. Um, so I know, I don't think it's something that like, you're, you're a bad person if you're not, or you have to, and I don't even know what it means. I just know for me, it's been truly profound. And the number of people I've found, even people who are maybe even atheists or, or not at all religious, who have had those experiences as well, but just keep them very personal and close mm -hmm. to themselves. Um, it's very common. I've been very surprised. It's so funny you say that. I think when I hear specifically contemporary contemporary uh, worship music, I I furrow my brow. You I despise throw up a it a little bit. Oh my yeah, gosh! My, my I, wife's kind of like that either. She's, <laughs> and like like I get it. Like I know how cheesy it is. It's like when you hear a cheesy '80s love ballad. I know how terrible it is, but I have to sing. It's. I think for me, I think I, I honestly feel like I'm, I'm missing out a little bit because I think part of my distaste for it is that growing up, I was what I would unpleasantly say was indoctrinated yeah. um, by a community, by my parents who had the best of intentions. And the way that it was put on me in hindsight had a very strong distaste in my mouth. So now when I hear it, I think of all the really the the negative experiences that I had with really the people and the explicitly anti-intellectualism of a lot of people in, uh, in in religious communities. Yeah. No. No. Well, let me ask you this: Do you play music? I do. Okay. Have you ever uh, played like in a band? No. Okay. So th this is this is interesting. So I've almost always been involved in singing or playing on you know when all my time when I was in, in church and we we don't go to church um, anymore for a variety of reasons, but. Um, when I just attend, let's say a church service, uh, and there's, you know, worship music, I can get into it, but it's never quite as profound when I'm, when I'm playing, there's something that happens. And, and this happens with any kind of music. If you're playing in a band, I think where you enter into this state where you're, 
you're co-creating not only by yourself, but with this other group. But the, I think the difference, and this can happen with non-worship music, but I think it's a lot more rare. The difference with worship music is all the people there, their main intention is not the music. Their main intention is to try to create, they're, they're all sort of seeking this like experience of this concept called God that they all have a fairly similar conception of, mm. and the music is sort of what they're using to do it. And so in a sense, everyone's doing this at the same time, but they're not doing the music first and having some sort of byproduct to be this experience. They're sort of seeking this experience first, and the music becomes this this sort of catalyst. And I don't know, I think, I, I'm guessing, even if it weren't uh, you know, Christian worship music, that kind of experience... Um, is is probably common among musicians who are in that groove. Yes, that sounds a lot like the experience of jazz. Yes. I have not played jazz in a band or anything, but I know I've talked to plenty of musicians who have, and that's kind of, jazz is supposed to be about the experience. Whether or not it's the, the same degree of profundity that we're talking about experiencing, you know, something divine or just some unique quality of the experience. I think that is, I think that's a big part of it. I want to kind of revisit and explore something you said earlier, which I personally, I think, disagree with. And I want to know, I, I want to pick your brain a bit. You said at the beginning of this, you said um, you are comfortable disassociating your logical and, and rational beliefs from the quality of, you know, these, these experiences. And from my perspective, but here's what I would say, and tell me if you disagree with this. Okay. There's no experience that can't even crudely be evaluated rationally. So there's no experience which is somehow a logical contradiction, or there's nothing which kind of escapes the purview of reason and analysis. So even if it's the case that that's, there's something, you know, let's just say something wild is true, that there is some personal a being that's out there that can, you know, talk to you and has and has spoken to, you know, religious leaders throughout the years. Let's just say that's all true. Even though it sounds kind of wild, it still would be something that's articulable and analyzable and the propositions are still kind of true and false. Do you shy away from that or or have I misinterpreted what you've said? No, I think I would agree with everything you said. I would I would probably define it maybe this way. I would say that philosophy, good philosophy, is the pursuit of truth confined to the use of reason, while religion or mystical experience is the pursuit of truth. Um, it may or may not include reason, uh, and it doesn't contradict reason, mm. but it's the pursuit of truth with the use of experience, practice, ritual, tradition, and mystery. And I guess I would say that the the difference, it's not that those experiences cannot be analyzed or understood through logic. I think, I think they can. Um, I think the the I guess the claim that I would make is even if we can't yet understand it or define it it doesn't mean that there's no validity to mm -hmm. it so so I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm not allowed to experience anything until I can logically explain it, right? I right. taste ice cream for the first time and it's this wonderful beautiful sensory experience <laughs> and to say you know you ask a kid well what what happened what do you think, how do you explain that experience right. of this taste and this rush? And if they're like, I don't know, but I know it was real. I'm not going to look down on them. Right. I'm going to say, okay, that's okay. Now, as they grow up, they'll find that like, it is able to be analyzed and explained through reason, but just because you can't or can't yet, I guess I, I sort of pursue these parallel tracks. I want to experience that. I want to consume so much uh, truth and, and, and pursue so much of this beautiful universe that I don't want to confine my exploration to only logic or only experience, which I think some people do. I want to be doing both in parallel tracks and I want to experience things that I can't yet explain. And I want to have the ability to logically explain things that I can't yet experience. Does that make sense? I think that is uh, very well articulated. And, um, I've talked to some of my family members about this, about, cause this, this experience that I had was so overwhelmingly profound. And the reasonable, rational, logical conclusion is entirely unsatisfactory, and it doesn't completely explain everything. So I can say with logical and rational precision that this experience 
had this flavor to it. It was so profound. It upended all of my values and and I believe in such and such because of it. And all of the all of the implications, the metaphysical implications, are perhaps such and such, and they're all you know logically consistent. But that's a completely ineffective argument when, yeah. when it comes down to it. The only reason that anybody should have any of these beliefs is by virtue of experiencing it. If somebody were to believe, if somebody were to say to me, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I heard what you said about love, and yeah, I believe in that too, just because of the argument, I, I, I think that's a mistake. <laughs> Several years ago, um, I, when I was at Alfred University, I went to a, uh, like it was like a church gathering on campus. There, I forget what they were, interdisciplinary studies or something like that. And they were putting on a lecture about I think it was like sexual immorality or something like that. And I attended occasional stuff like that just because I, you know, wanted to get their opinions and, th- and think about these things. And um, afterwards, uh, there were two pastors that were there whom I'd never met. And I spoke with them at length about God and all these things. And one of them I was wholly uh, uh, unimpressed by, to be frank. He was trying to make just the purely logical, reasonable arguments, and he was doing a bad job at it. But there was another guy who was saying, yeah, I see what you're saying, Steve. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And he said, you're not going to like this. He said, but it comes down to, at some point, you're going to have an experience, which is going to, all of these things are going to click into place, and then you're going to understand. He said, there's no way that you can understand, even rationally, without the experience. And at the time, it was prior to the experience, I thought, what a crack of crap. This is nonsense. Um, that's not a good argument. It's an, inc- it is an incomplete argument. Why would I believe what you're saying? And then sure enough, <laughs> probably about, I don't know, two two years later, something like that, you know, I had this experience of love. And it, well, it's, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, th- this is where this is where I think it is meaningful to talk about sort of the difference between Western thinking and Eastern thinking. I mean, even, even just within the, the Christian tradition, if you look at like the Eastern Orthodox, it's, it's very different. But growing up in... Basically, you know, a typical Protestant, um, you know, religious experience in, in the West. There's this focus on, okay, all this stuff, and I guess maybe this comes from from Aquinas. I'm not sure where it originates, but all this stuff that's part of this religious experience, it's not enough to go through it and to sort of try to try to experience God or or in Christian speak to to have a personal relationship or whatever. We also have to do this thing called apologetics. We have to win the argument. We have to win the logical argument. And that's not bad to analyze things logically and to do that stuff. But I used to be really, really into that. And, and the typical sermon, right, at a Protestant church is like, here's this piece of uh, the Bible. Here's this chapter. And then here are the 10 clear, tangible things you need to do right now to implement it. Or, you know, here are the three laws or the four rules, right? Whereas like in the East, it's like, Here's a mystery. Right. Contemplate it. Be overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, and, and this idea that like and like apologetics. So I started out really interested in in my early teens. I think most people who grow up in the church at some point when they experience the world, they they feel this need to like this. They're on the they feel like they're on the defensive. Mm-hmm. Like people think this believes are crazy. So I got to like, you know, you go out for, for with all the wrong motivations. Right. Tr- right. Truth seeking as in give me some arguments that, <laughs> prove, that prove what I want to believe already. Precisely. And so you, you go out and you start doing all this research and apologetics and whatever. And you find several things. I mean, one, you find that actually um, some of the best philosophers are theists. And there's some phenomenal just in raw philosophy. There are phenomenal arguments yes. and debates about theism, about the immortality of the soul, all this stuff that are that are truly profound in and of themselves. And when you're only looking for it as a way to win an argument, you sort of like miss out. I just I just remember I started diving into apologetics and theology and, and philosophy of religion. And I suddenly didn't care about winning the arguments anymore because I just found the debates themselves so fascinating. Right. Um, but this need to explain everything and to, and to like, you know, prove the historical existence of the miracles in the Old Testament and all this, mm-hmm. it's so limiting to me. It's so sad. I, I think that, I think that um, accepting certain tenets of a religion without necessarily having to provide logical proof for all of them is actually better. It, it, it's more respectful of that religion than attempting to get the answer that can win the argument for everything. Because at the end of the day, like it doesn't matter to me whether or not some story in the Old Testament actually happened. There's a truth contained within it that's actually pretty profound 
um, whether or not it's historically true. And I don't want to miss out on the profoundness of that truth that may be transformative in my life because I'm so busy trying to prove or disprove that this actually happened. I mean, if I was, if I just spent all my time trying to disprove that Lord of the Rings was a real story, uh, I would, I wouldn't get much out of it. Right. (laughs) So, um, would you say then that it is kind of a misunderstanding of, uh, religious texts and religious ideas to treat them for lack of a better term in the, in the Christian context, like with biblical literalism, treating the Bible as, as a historical text, as a scientific document that you draw literal truths from. Do you think that kind of misses the whole point? I do. I do. I mean, the Bible is a, a fascinating document in of itself because it's not a document, right? I mean, it's just this huge collection of different things. Like there are histories in the Bible and genealogies, there's poetry, there's, you know, uh, some kind of lucid or drug tripping dreaming states. There's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, so, you know, there are parts of it that are historic. Like if I was just a historian trying to understand some time in history or an archeologist, like I'm sure I would use some parts of the Bible to, you know, look at what, what happened in history. But I think to see it as this unified literal truth, as in, you know, everything that's spoken is literal. Um, it's only, all you're going to do is spend all your time trying to like split hairs over. Okay. Okay. Was this a metaphor or was this (laughs) literal or was it? And what's the whole point of this thing? Isn't the whole point of religion to, to be transformative, to, to help you become something to experience something. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a huge, um, a huge lost, I guess, I I guess you're leaving a lot on the table, a lot of the the best stuff. And I, and from my own experience and the conversations that I've had with lots of people who grew up in the same community, not only is it kind of missing the boat, but it pushes tons and tons of people away from the ideas. Cause if, if somebody's understanding of Christianity is the literalist understanding that thinks, you know, uh, there is literally a serpent in the garden of Eden that literally, you know, somehow had vocal cords and literally its mouth moved and it talked and it spoke to these two people. I mean, maybe that happened. It's a logical <laughs> possibility, but I think it's more likely to push people away. And I think that that's kind of a misapplication of, yeah. of the use of reason, um, which, which part of my own, I suppose it still is anger after these years is precisely that. It's, there are, like you said, there are fantastic arguments for theism and for religious ideas and, and, and for the historic historicity of lots of events and people in the Bible. That's great. And in different religious texts, but to philosophically not understand that the whole text cannot be read that way, I think is a grave error, but it's a wonderful segue. You know, well, well, let me quickly throw one thing in, because I know this is something you're really interested in is, um, in sort of the sciences more broadly, this obsession with uh, data and so-called like, oh, I only judge things by the data. These you know, sort of empiricism um, that is never really true. Everyone's always using theory. And I think there's a similar phenomena with these sort of biblical examples. If, if I said to you, um, okay, I can prove that the serpent in the garden was an actual serpent, um, does that change the value of the Bible to, to, to you if you're already a, a Christian? Or if I can prove to you that it was not, like, does everything that Christianity meant to you suddenly dissolve? Like, is, right. your, is your belief system really totally anchored on this one data point? And like the factual accuracy of that data is going to make or break it. And I think that's such a fundamentally wrong way to view things. I mean, even, even in a field we both love, economics, if your entire case for why, you know, wage floors are detrimental uh, to an economy can be destroyed. If I show you one data point where there was a wage floor and people still made a lot of money, then there's something wrong with your theory to begin right. with, you know? Right. And it's so counterproductive too, because in, in, in my perspective, the sad reality is that a lot of people do hinge their entire yes. understanding of religion on the on this all or nothing, it's a hundred percent of the Bible or it's zero of it, or it's a hundred percent of these literalist ideas, or it's all wrong. You and I both grew up in the Christian tradition. What I want to know is is more about your conception, and this is something I'm really trying to work through because I really don't I don't have an answer for it. What is your conception of Jesus Christ? Hmm. Is is what number one? Do you think that? This is a an actual person, not necessarily that that's you know a critical part of the theory. Do you think that he is a like in the evangelical sense the he's man and God at the same time? Do you or or do you think this is kind of where I'm leaning, but I'm not I'm not quite sure that he was a man who was 
in extraordinary alignment with mm-hmm. the principles that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, I, okay, okay. Like I said, a previous question. Yes. <laughs> to all of the above. <laughs> so I think there's no denying that something profound and pretty, pretty world changing and in pretty amazing ways, uh, you know, happened at, um, you know, the, the beginning of the, the, the modern age, I guess, or the beginning of, uh, you know, AD. And I think, um, you know, for, as for the, the historical, historical accuracy of Jesus, I mean, I, I haven't ever really seen much compelling evidence. I haven't dug that much that like there, that Jesus literally didn't exist at all. And there wasn't anyone who these Christians, you know, followed and, and mm-hmm. this tradition just sprung up with, with no actual, you know, person. Um, so yeah, I think there's, something there historically. Again, I haven't looked into that a lot, but in terms of like what actually, what was Jesus or what is Jesus? I think right now, what is the most compelling to me and offers the most kind of explanatory power and is the most consistent with my own current experiences and level of knowledge is that Jesus was an archetype. You know, there's a lot of scriptures about Jesus being like the uh, the second Adam, right? So this in the whole Christian mythology, or in the, in the in, you know the I mean, this even connects to other religions as well. When you add the Old Testament, but the idea that humans, you know, from their from their origin, there's this potential that they have to be godlike, to be like these entities that are you know um, maybe pre pre exist us, etc., and they there's something keeping them from that, but really like it's within them, right? The kingdom of God is within you. It's within them to Mm. ascend in a way, to access something greater, to become greater. They have an ability to, to do more than, um, maybe the other creatures on earth, for example. And there's, there's something there that they can maybe activate or access. And, And so this theme of man, like trying to achieve that state, but that state being possible and, you know, Adam theoretically having begun from that state and then Jesus being the second Adam is like this archetype is in, in the Eastern tradition. They call the, the process of salvation theosis, literally the process of becoming God. And Jesus said, you know, even said things like, have I not said that, that ye are gods or you will do things that I have done and even more. There was nothing about his message that said, look, you're never going to be the same as me. It was more like. Here, here's the pattern. Here's what a human being living up to his full potential looks like. Hmm. Here's someone who is in alignment more than maybe anyone else uh, has been. Um, this is, this is the example. This is the the archetype of humans at their full potential, fully sort of accessing that that side of them, that that spiritual side of them, uh, as well as the the logical side. And I think that's how I see Jesus. And in that sense. The question of like the historical truth or whatever else really becomes uninteresting to me mm-hmm. because it's it's the power of what that represents, what that archetype represents um, that I find so compelling. Like once you understand, it's like Neo in the Matrix, like once he can see it, once you understand what's actually going on in the universe, you will be able to, to, to do things to live in such a way that's far beyond what you can now. Um, and so that's kind of how I see Jesus, and that's a very powerful narrative uh, to me that, that is, I don't know, I guess useful and profound in my own journey. Uh, I think that's very plausible. Um, in fact, I think I, just on, on the surface, I think I agree with all that. That sounds most um, uh, intellectually compelling to me, but I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on this just because they popped in my head. When you say that Jesus is this archetype, why do you think it's the case that this person had this ability to live in accordance with these principles. Is it that like the Christians would say, you know, God sent him that this was like an act that this was supposed to happen when it did. And he, there was something unique that allowed him to act in this way. Or do you think that, you know, for example, he had at a young age, he had a religious mystical experience and then became enlightened, if you will, and then lived the rest of his life in accordance with those principles. Yeah, that's probably the the thing that, you know, so it's so sort of just give a broader context. So, you know, growing up um, in the church and then just essentially going on this long intellectual journey and then kind of additionally this sort of experiential journey of, of exploring what I believe. And, and like I said, basically losing all interest in apologetics and things like that for a long time. 
um, kind of arriving at these general ideas that I laid out at the beginning of the show about sort of God and religion in general. And then only recently in the last few years have I kind of returned to the question of Jesus. Okay, so where does Jesus fit in all this stuff? Um, and I'm and I'm sort of newly working it out, trying to understand it, trying to explore different options. So I'm, I'm very like, I don't have, I would say an answer. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I, I think the, the options that you gave are pretty much the only ones that we can, we can look at it. It is either the case that, um, it is either the case that Jesus was, uh, had the same basically material starting point that any of us do. And, was somehow able through some experience or through his own whatever self-discipline and and uh, rigorous pursuit able to achieve a higher level of you know connection with with truth than we than most of us are able to or that Jesus was a kind of reset in a way or a kind of there was something truly unique about the origin of Jesus that um you know the the story of the virgin birth talks mm-hmm. about this that that Whatever it is that it, that has caused humanity, um, and for however long it's been the case, to to not be in alignment with um, truth, even with our own truth. I mean, and we know this in our daily experience, whether you call it sin or not. Like we're not living up to our best selves most of the time, and we know this. Um, that there was something about the origin of Jesus that was different, some outside force, some you know, God Himself intervened to say, we're going to sort of have this one be set apart um, to kind of you know, interject it to show what's possible. And then people will be able to follow that and map onto that. And I don't know, I honestly don't know sort of which of those is the case. I don't either. And I think either way is extraordinarily profound. <laughs> you know, if, if it's true that he, there was nothing essentially unique at the beginning of Jesus's life, that's a very radical example of what is possible for all humans, the exact yeah. same starting point. And if it's not the case, if that he, he was like a, you know, a divine child, if you will, well, what, is, what does that imply? That, there, <laughs> that on Earth, you know, on, on planet Earth, there's this uniqueness that like the creator of the universe said, I'm going to make a baby and it's going to be this example like that. Either way you spin it, I think that's uh, profound. So only very recently, and I still have a lot more that I'm interested in digging into this, have I discovered... Um, the work of this philosopher, uh, Rene Girard. Um, and, and he's a, he's a, a Christian. Um, but I only read one of his books, but it was so interesting. Uh, it was called the scapegoat. And he essentially tells a story of all, it's basically a sociological interpretation of what Christ was and what that means for the world of through all of human history, Um, every society has had this pattern that, that basically what, what maybe Christians would call like sin or something. There's this pattern of, uh, he calls it mimetic desire. It's kind of like envy. Basically we want things not because we actually want them, but because we see that other people want them. So we all just want the same things. This causes conflict over scarce resources. And every so often this conflict builds up and humans as a way to sort of a a release valve for the pressure, they pick a scapegoat, Mm. they do violence against that scapegoat as a way to kind of maintain social art. I mean, this is where child sacrifice came from. He, he goes through all these literary texts and myths and basically shows every one of these is a case of um, somebody being persecuted. And it's told from the perspective of the persecutors, so it makes it look as if they're the ones doing good. Like the witch hunts, you know, our crops are dying. There must be, they all focus their anger mm-hmm. on one person or one scapegoat, um, you know, one ethnic minority. They exile them or kill them. And then like peace restores. And there's this cycle of violence based on this mimetic desire. And in his interpretation, the what what Jesus is life and in particular the death meant was this was the first time in history that the victim of this collective violence um, was indisputably innocent and mm. claimed to be innocent. And in, t- in most cases, even the victims will like believe the myth themselves. Like, you know, I guess I do need to be thrown overboard or whatever. Um, and after all of this happened, it revealed this whole thing for what it was, this horrible sham. And for the first time opened up the possibility for humans to, um, not, rely on this cycle of, of scapegoating, um, in violence because they can address the mimetic desire that's at the heart of it in the first place. And he actually like kind of leaves that book off with like, basically you can see for the last 2000 years, it's been a constant cycle of this kind of violence, reducing things that were normal for most of history, like child sacrifice rituals, where you sacrificed a person or an animal to the gods, 
Those are appalling to us now, and it's all because of this Christ's death, the martyrdom of Christ. The, the concept of an innocent martyr itself was basically invented, and it sort of shocked the world. Um, I got a lot more to look into on that, but it's fascinating. I think, too, it, there, there's a principle there that applies, as far as I can tell, across the board of hum, human uh, experience, which is that when we don't have a contrast to our actions— we limit ourselves in terms of what we think is possible. So without the, it may be the example of Jesus Christ, it wasn't even on the table that you could live uh, in this sort of way. And you, I think you see that all across the board. And people, even in their um, intellectual development, even in my intellectual development, I didn't realize the uh, profound accuracy and, and persuasive power of ideas that I was never exposed to. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we'll have to leave it there. I don't want to take any more of your time. Uh, thank you so much for talking to me, Isaac. This has been a scintillating conversation. Hey, thank you, Steve. Uh, as I said, I, I don't normally like talking about religion because I think most people don't actually want to talk about religion. They want to make you an enemy or an ally and, <laughs> and advance some cause. And you had nothing. You just wanted to explore. So this was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. They, and I, I'll say, too, I think I've concluded, um, given your and my upbringing in Christ Christian evangelicalism, I think we're both heretics. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Isaac. You bet. All right, that was my interview with Mr. Isaac Morehouse. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I certainly did. It's always great to be able to talk about things that you're not supposed to. <laughs> if you value this content, if you think that you'd like to hear more voices like this, then please check out patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. You can support the show for as little as a dollar or two whenever a new episode is released. And if you also want to help out the show, you can leave a rating and a review on iTunes. Just recently, I noticed I got a couple of little jerks from YouTube, some, you know, undergrad student that thinks he knows what he's talking about, who feels, who's taken it upon himself to think, you know, I want to protect the world of ideas from these crankish Steve Patterson ideas. So he went in, left a one-star review, got his friend to leave another one-star review on iTunes to try to reduce my rankings on iTunes to prevent people from hearing these heretical ideas. So if you want to stick it in his eye, then please leave a rating and a review. I would certainly appreciate it. All right, that's it for me. I hope you guys have a wonderful and heretical day. <laughs>